Welcome to Under the Radar, a show about independent iOS app development. I'm Marco Arment. And I'm David Smith. Under the Radar is never longer than 30 minutes, so let's get started. So today I wanted to talk about designing for misuse, uh, and, and maybe abuse too, um, and maybe some malicious use. But, you know, just general categories of misuse of people trying to use your apps either maliciously or in ways that you didn't intend or consider when you design them and kind of how you can deal with that and how you can mitigate or minimize the uh, the negative uh, effects of that. I mean, so you you have a number of apps. I'm thinking of things like my recipe book uh, or audiobooks even where like somebody could potentially get a ton of data in there, like a ton of records or like a ton of audiobooks or s- stuff like that. Like, like, do you, when you design things, do you account for, like, very, very heavy users who might be using the app to do or store way more than you designed it for? I, it, it's something I've definitely didn't do or what initially and had since have to, had to learn a lot of lessons about doing. Um, like, in preparation of this episode, I took a look in my recipe sync system and I found, I was like, look, I wonder how many recipes the biggest users have. And the biggest user has 13,000 recipes. <laughs> oh, my God. In, in, their, in their sync account. Um, and they use the app. I, would, I also checked how often, like, are they actually still using it? And it's like their last, um, they're, they added their last one yesterday. So they are still using it with 13,000 recipes. And I did not in any way design the app to scale for to 13,000 recipes. Um, so it's something that I've had to learn and I'll get the support requests from people who are like, why won't it just like, you know, sync, sync seems really slow and I go and check their account and they have, even if not, you know, 13,000, but even like two or 3,000 recipes. And I'm like, yeah, that's, that's going to be tough on an iPad too, to, <laughs> to just move that amount of data around and quickly search it and things that, I mean, the numbers aren't massive in and of themselves, but I think like you're saying, it's, you have to design your app and be adaptive to it in that way or otherwise things will just fall down horribly um because like your app if your app doesn't you know sort of scale well or gracefully um it's going to kind of fall apart and so now when i'm doing these kinds of things i always have to think in the back of my mind like how it's not even how many how many records or how many entries could someone reasonably have it's like how many records could someone unreasonably have (laughs) <laughs> like what That's is great. what like what's the limit here beyond which it would be completely impractical for them to even get there and it's also probably worth saying like that person who has 13,000 recipes like they've been at inter- entering into the system into the system for i think 3 years now like they've been using the app for 3 years and so even like you have to keep in mind that things will just gradually grow and extend over time that it's not even just, oh, someone's being silly and just like creating a million entries in my system. It's like, no, they could just use it a lot. And over the course of several years, because hopefully your app will be around for several years, it'll get to a point that things are way beyond what you may have originally thought or expected. Oh, yeah. I mean, like, you know, and this isn't that unreasonable of a thing to, like, from the user point of view, like, you might, you might think, as a user, oh, I'm using everything as design, but like there, there's probably like one or two things in your in your setup, either the apps you use, or, or maybe like a giant folder on your computer, or some giant database you have of like, oh, I happen to have, I happen to be a music collector and have like a hundred thousand MP3s, or or I happen to have a lot of photos or whatever else, like. Almost everybody has the extremes of something, you know. Like, like we, I, like I, our friend Merlin Mann um, over at Back to Work has often talked about his trouble finding uh, Dropbox text file markdown editors because, like, that whole category of apps that there's a million of on the App Store to edit uh, Dropbox note text files. Because um, he has like thousands of them because he uses them in, in all sorts of ways that a lot of people don't consider or don't think of. And a lot of times, like he he'll, he'll try a new app and it'll just crash or it'll you know, searching will be impossibly slow or something. You know, like this. This happens a lot. Like almost everybody has like one thing where they are pushing the bounds on. Um, like I have with Overcast, I've, I have users that uh, first started reporting like slow sync issues, and I, I would again I would dig in with them, and, and I'd find out that they would have like 150 podcast subscriptions, 
And it's like most people have trouble keeping up with three to five podcasts every week. And this guy has 150, uh, but he's using them. He, you know, he's using the app. Like, I'm not going to like that's that's that's, you know, that's these people's prerogative. If they want to use the app that way, if it's not like malicious against you in any way, what's the problem? Um, so, you know, you have to design for these kind of extremes and you have to test for them. Like, you'd be surprised like how 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 quickly either your app or your server uh, the server side process, if you're syncing them to a server or dealing with server anyway, how quickly you can hit memory limits. Because like a lot of these, like, like you know, my backend is all PHP. And yes, make fun of it as much as you want. But almost every language has on the server side some kind of memory limit that you can configure. Um, often it's set by default to something, you know, re- in like the hundreds of megabytes usually at most. Um, so, you know, you might have like a PHP process might be able to max out at like 32 megs or 128 megs, something in that range. Well, if somebody has like 10,000 items that you're trying to sync and the server's trying to deal with that, you actually might hit that, like depending on the design of your system. Um, Similarly, on on iOS, like if you're trying to read all those records into memory to do some kind of batch operation or some kind of inefficient counting or something like that, uh, if if you have your own custom data interaction layer here and you are dealing with 10,000 records, 100,000 records, and an app that you designed to have a few hundred records, you might blow the memory limit on the iOS device and the app might get killed or crash. So this is, you know, this is pretty, pretty important stuff to at least deal with gracefully or as gracefully as you can. You know, your app should at least not crash, you know, if a heavy user uses it. And so you should be as much as much as it's possible to, you should be testing for this. Like, if you have an app with any kind of user login system, have a user that has you know way more content or data or records than you think is is normal, or or that you even think anybody would ever have. You know, like I like uh, during the development of Bre- of uh, Vesper, uh, our friend Brent Simmons was uh, f- was blogging here and there about how like they had. They had like a test data that was like thousands of notes, and they knew that almost nobody would ever take thousands and thousands of notes, but they wanted to make sure the app worked well uh, and didn't crash and hopefully was fast and was still actually good and functional uh, with way more data than they expected. So like, you know, first, first priority, don't break, you know, don't crash, uh, don't make the UI like break in weird ways like if like something overflowing its bounds or rendering in the wrong spot because like some assumption was broken about how long something would be um and and try to not slow down noticeably so there's many strategies for this that it you know beyond the scope of this episode um but you know generally you want to you know you want to have some kind of database back end you know not like a p list with ten thousand entries in it like <laughs> you, know, you want to have some kind of database uh if you use core data it will do a lot of this for you especially if you use like the the fetch results controllers right because you use those yeah, here and there I right do. yeah and then they handle that's how most of this gets done in my apps it's like rely on problems that were uh, solved at a different level like because core data was designed to scale from like 10 records to 10,000 or 10 million records like it's intended to be able to do that and so if you use it that way you know if it does all the nice batching for you and only pulling in like pointers to things rather than the whole their whole contents initially and all that kind of stuff like if you do it thoughtfully in that way then you know a lot of this work can sort of be done for you or at least the first pass at this kind of work can be done for you. Exactly. So, you know, generally, you know, don't break under heavy usage like this if you can help it. And then try not to slow down. And so, you know, use this as appropriate. Make sure, you know, watch your memory limits. It helps to, like, you know, if, if you can run some testing where you can go into instruments and watch memory usage of your app and, like, see how it changes if somebody has... 10 rows versus 10,000 rows. And, you know, the, it should not be going up linearly with the amount of data that's being stored in your app. You know, your, 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 your in-memory set should not be scaling up. Uh, your, you know, your, your on-disk set obviously could, but, you know, in-memory should not. Um, so, you know, beyond the technical side of making sure it works, and, you know, again, that's not a small thing, but, but beyond, <laughs> beyond the technical side of things, there are things you can do in the design of the app to kind of help make this manageable for people and, and help help yourself out too with like the amount of load that you're placing on various uh, parts of it and you know how how something might break so one i think one of the, one of the staples of ios uh, app usability and design is the table view you know the table view first of all it's designed in such a way especially when paired with core data uh, or or an intelligent other layer it's designed in such a way that it can scale ridiculously well. You know, when you combine the the way the cells are reused and only certain amounts of data are paged in at once, combine that with like the the estimations of cell heights and the estimations of of 
sections and numbers of things in sections and then you have like the the like first letter on the right side like in like in the phone contacts app you have like the letter jumping on the side where you can sort and that's also by the way helpful in different languages that you don't support use apples please just (laughs) use apple's thing and you'll be mostly okay you know stuff like that having like easy navigation intelligent sorting of long lists like you know you might have a list in your app that's sorted chronologically um if there's no way to sort it alphabetically and somebody might have 10,000 items, that might be problematic. You know, like, the, like just think about, like, how your, how your sorting in your app works, and if there's anything you can do in the, des- in the UI design of the app to make it less cumbersome or impossible to use for somebody who is, in your opinion, grossly overusing it or grossly overfilling it. Because that will happen. There will be good reasons for it. And, you know, if possible, don't break under that, right? And so other things also in that in that category would involve search. Search is a big one here. You know, any kind of local search you can offer that doesn't use a server is is easy. First of all, um, almost every database supports it. Uh, SQLite supports it. Um, you know, you can just write your own dumb one if you really want to, but please use the search index. It's much easier. <laughs> like using stuff like that can really help people who have tons and tons of of entries. Can really help them find their data and use your app. And with search, like, you know, the, the way it works with, like, basically a whole bunch of binary trees and, and everything, like, you can you can make a vast number of records accessible via search without a ton of work and without a ton of CPU time being spent. Um, so, you know, if, if there's any possibility of somebody having a ton of data in your app, offer a search if it makes sense to, uh, because it really does, uh, it, sc- it, it, lets your, it lets your app scale well. Uh, because all of this is really talking about app scaling it's like you know in in kind of in the in the way that you know website scaling is really talking about like number of users or amount of traffic app scaling for one person in this case is like talking about the amount of data they might store in your app and what kind of technical and organizational challenges that will present exactly and the nice thing too is that most of these changes these improvements these ways of like looking at your app at high usage whatever that might mean for your app will almost always make it better for the typical case. That, like, you avoid the... Like, if your app does get linearly worse every time the user adds a record, like, that's incredibly problematic when you have 10,000 records. But it means that every single time the user is using the app, they're making it slightly worse for themselves. (laughs) Like that's yeah, not you're good. discouraging use. Yeah, like what you want is to make sure that you know your app scales gracefully in this way, but mostly because then that means that it's probably going to be a lot better for um, you know your typical user. Like, and obviously that's something you want to keep in the back of your mind that you don't want to be making changes that are only beneficial if you have ten thousand users or ten thousand records, because very few users are going to have that. And so, if it makes your app way more complicated, then that's probably not good. But looking at it in these ways, you get these benefits. I mean, it's like you were saying with like UI table view is really efficient. And UI table view was designed like for the original iPhone. Like as far as I know, it's like that was built into, you know, iPhone OS one when things were incredibly constrained and tight. And it made the an, an OS, you know, where a lot of things are just scrolling lists, really performant and powerful. And so then as devices got more capable, it got even better. And in the same way, it's like if you are designing things so that they work when things are constrained, in this case, when they're constrained by having large numbers of things, when you aren't constrained in that way, suddenly everything's just better and faster and probably instantaneous for most of your users. Like if things only take a few seconds for your extreme users, they're probably going to be, you know, instantaneous or momentary for your typical user. And that's what you want. And like that, this exercise is helpful in that way of looking at your app and saying, well, where could I make this better? Like an, an easy, obvious case is just to say like, well, let me throw way more things into it than I need and see where I can make it better as a result. Exactly. And, you know, and you're, like you mentioned, like, you know, trying to optimize for typical use, you know, versus versus the uh, the kind of extremes. And the fact is, like when you're when you're talking about adding any kind of organizational system, something like I'm thinking, like you know, like like one level of folders or tags, which are basically folders, like you know, one level of organization to like abstract something away, that can go a long way. Like if you have an app where people might often have more than about you know twenty to fifty records, like they might want some kind of way to organize that, and that, like having just one level of folder hierarchy 
could also scale to 10,000 items fairly well. Like, you don't have, like, a little goes a long way here. You don't really have to go overboard with, with accommodating for these things in the UI because, you know, the, the high end users, any little bit will help them tremendously and it won't put too much of a burden on regular users. Exactly. And obviously, these are all like, these are the kinds of things we're talking about are in the good case where things are, people are using your app in the way that you intended it and just using it a lot. But obviously, they also, they could talk, use, there could be problems that you could run into on the malicious side. Um, and we're about to talk about that. But before we do, could you tell me about something that's awesome? We are sponsored this week by DevMate. Go to devmate.com slash radar to learn more. DevMate is a single SDK with a set of advanced backend features for Mac developers that allows them to easily integrate in-app purchasing, software licensing, auto updates, crash reports, user feedback, and more, all for Mac apps without being in the Mac App Store. This is very useful stuff if you're a Mac developer because you don't have to handle all these things for you know all manually for yourself. Plus, all the analytics for your app with sales and downloads are all available real-time in DevMate's dashboard. That's real-time sales analytics data. MacPaw are very excited to announce that DevMate's rich functionality is now free for all and is instantly accessible after integration. MacPaw use these tools themselves to help them build their own apps, including Clean My Mac, and you can and you can take a look at on their site to see examples of the many other developers that also rely on DevMate. There's some big names there. These days, more and more developers are eager to sell outside the Mac App Store. Having DevMate as an ultimate solution for independent OS X development is a great place to start. You can find out more right now by going to devmate.com slash radar. Once again, that's devmate.com slash radar. If you're a Mac developer, you got to check this out. Thank you very much to DevMate for sponsoring Under the Radar and all of Relay FM. All right. So obviously, if you, you know, people are just putting lots of data in your app. Like that's not really problematic. It could be problematic if your app doesn't handle it well, but there's also cases where rather than just your users using the app in a positive, like they just love it, you know, like this person just really loves baking and wants to put 13,000 recipes in their in their in, in my sync system, there can also be t- cases, um, especially as your app gets um, attention or popular or you get attention or become popular, where people might want to misuse your application um, for whatever reason or in whatever way. And so it's kind of important that you also think about it from those perspectives of what's the worst that people could do? What could people be doing with my app or with my backend? You know, if someone ran like a Wireshark application and looked at all the network traffic between my app and my server, are there things that I wouldn't want them to know um, or would be operations that they could do that would really hurt me? Um, and you kind of have to start thinking through these basic security things um, in order to make sure that your app is going to be stable and worthwhile. Um, and also, like in the same kind of way we were saying before, if you do these things, um, it, it can prevent misuse, but it also will probably make basic use better because then your app is more secure. Your user's data is more secure. Things are more reliable. Um, and so it does take a bit of work and a bit of thoughtfulness, but these are things that are kind of basic things that are probably important if you want to get into any kind of thing that that it's you stores or uses users data oh yeah and you know like when you have any kind of you know if you just have a local app that has no web component uh, that you at least that you run but you know if, if you just have a local app there's only so much a user can do to to hurt anyone else or you using the app uh, but as soon as you have a service behind it, uh, or especially like a web interface, uh, there there's so much that people can do that, you know, the good thing is that web security is, is a pretty well-known field at this point. I mean, it's not solved. Uh, it's not flawless. But, you know, the, the, the major categories of danger are well-known, and many of them can be avoided you know, without too much work these days, because we, you know, we've had a long time to work on web security. Um, and so, like, you know, like one one of the basics is obviously to use SSL. You know, if you have uh, any kind of API that's running over HTTP, use SSL. This is not difficult these days. Uh, in fact, what, one tip I've come across recently is, uh, so I host all my stuff on Linode, and they have these things called node balancers, which are, which are just like their own like kind of managed load balancing things for twenty bucks a month. Um, and so I use I use node balancers not only for load balancing, but even when I only have one server behind them, I use the node balancer for SSL decryption and also to be kind of a front end because then the actual IP of the machine is not you know being directly exposed to the users, 
And also, that is handling all the SSL decryption for me so that and, – and Linode keeps these maintained and keeps these updated so that whenever SSL changes, whenever like people discover, oh, this old cipher is actually actually has a weakness that we, did, that we just learned about, so nobody should use that. Everyone should upgrade to TLS 1. whatever or you know, disable this certain cipher or anything. They do all that for you. So you are always kept on top of it. You just paste it in your certificate and your key into their admin panel, and then your server talks regular HTTP to the load balancer, and the load balancer, excuse, the node balancer, excuse me, the node balancer then is handling all the security for you. So that's I highly recommend if you're on Linode and you can spare another twenty bucks a month, uh, outsource your your SSL dealing with to a node balancer. <laughs> it, it's a lot easier. Um, and, and you know, but even if you have to do it yourself, you know, just keep on top of it. There's a there's a Qualys SSL test that you can you can kind of test your site and see how it does on the security thing. Just you know, go test it every few months or whenever you hear any news about it. Um, just make sure you're on top of things. But uh, or you can just outsource it, like I did. Excuse me. Or you can just outsource it, and it's uh, no big deal. Um, also for web pages, uh, consider using content security policy. This is a, a relatively young uh, web thing. It's a, it's a header you put on on, rep- on responses, uh, CSP or content security policy. It's a thing that um, it's basically a declaration you make in the headers that tells the browser where from what domains and what types of JavaScript and CSS and assets are permitted to be loaded by this page. And what this is mostly useful for is to eliminate a whole category of vulnerabilities like cross-site scripting. Um, there's, and there's tons of vulnerabilities that this just completely negates for browsers that support it. And almost every modern browser will enforce it, um, as far as I know. So, you know, using content security policy uh, with SSL and with uh, HSTS, uh, Strict Transport Security, which will enforce SSL, um, for basically everything for all modern browsers, like using those things, you are way more secure than the average service and you know plus you know basic service security as we talked about last week or two weeks ago rather um so that is that'll get you a huge huge part of the way there um and and i I mean heck i even in my podcast app i even have uh ssl certificate pinning which is complete overkill for a podcast app but what that means is it makes it a lot harder for anybody to not only snoop my traffic and break the app that way but also for like for you know creepy middlemen like like when you get on airplane wi-fi and it injects ads into everything you see now or you know like it it makes it impossible for those kind of things to interfere with my app and which protects me and it protects my users so it's you know, these kind of things like they seem like overkill if you're just making an app for something basically playing podcasts but in in the modern era this really isn't overkill and it really isn't that hard and i think that's the important thing too like a lot of these things like a little goes a long way like just there's all these you know best practices and things you're talking about of like the different types of security and the uh, different approaches you can take but doing anything is going to do a lot just to get started with and like if you're going to do it fair enough do it properly but all of these things, like any time, if you just like, you, there's no reason to be sending anything in plain text in like a modern app. It just does, it just doesn't make sense. Like maybe media, maybe, but in general, like you may, you just may as well. Like things are, it's, it doesn't make your things slower or or more expensive or those types of things. Like it's just makes the app better. And so if you can do it, because you're just trying to minimize the things, the directions that people can could you know be. Uh, mischievous with your application exactly so moving on from now like direct security attacks i want to talk a little bit about spam um if your app has any kind of user-generated content that could potentially be exposed to other users of the app or to the public like on your website and it's some kind of like top rank list or most popular content or anything like that that is a potential vector for spam, for people to spam your site or your service or your app in order to promote their own stuff or deface stuff or make people look at porn or whatever else. Uh, there's, you know, so anything where user-generated content could be shown to a larger audience of your app's users. Um, you have to be very, very careful about these kind of things that, that become possible. Um, it's, you know, it's one thing to just think, Oh well, I'm I'm gonna make you know suppose suppose you have like in Overcast I have a recommendations thing. Suppose I, I would I was gonna show on the website top recommended things, which I kind of do in the app, but I'll get to that. Um, you have to think like how could somebody spam this in order to promote their own thing or show inappropriate content uh, or something you know so, somehow break it in a way that would be valuable to them or would you know deface the the whole thing and and make make everyone look bad. 
and you might think, oh, I can just keep on top of it. I'll just check it every day, and I'll, I'll delete anything that looks wrong, and it'll be fine. The fact is, you can't and you won't police it yourself. Like you, you that is, unless you have a very large, dedicated staff doing this around the clock, uh, and in and every different language around the world, uh, you're probably not going to be able to police spam yourself. Um, a, a, you know, you can you can look at the big services like like Twitter, for instance, where spam is a thing, and the, it is not a small deal for a company like Twitter um, to to try to prevent and and eliminate spam as it comes. It, that takes a huge staff, so you probably won't have that luxury. Um, so, my solution to this is to generally just avoid creating mechanisms that can be spammed. Um, so avoid creating global top lists, you know, any kind of like global rankings, most popular lists. I don't even have like, you can't even review podcasts in Overcast. You can't like write written user reviews that are shown to anybody else because that's also spam, you know, promotional problems like you know, defacing and everything, legal problems. So like just if you can avoid any area that can be spammed. If you can't avoid it, uh, try to outsource the control of that spam or the decision on whether something is spam. Try to outsource that to some other larger authority. So, and I'm not I'm not talking about other spam filters. I'm not talking about like you know a Kismet or anything like that. I'm talking about outsourcing it to some other authority that themselves would need to have spam get through in a, in a significant way for it to be a problem for you. So, in Overcast case. I use iTunes IDs because iTunes reviews every podcast that goes in, and I have never seen spam in the iTunes podcast directory. Uh, I've seen bad podcasts, but I've, I've never actually <laughs> seen like you know what most people consider blatant spam uh, in there. And it also helps control like adult content and you know stuff like that because they also look for that. So in Overcast, I won't show a podcast in search results unless I can match it to something in the iTunes directory. And if I can't, it stays private. Like you can still enter it by URL, but it's not going to be shown to people who weren't looking for it. So that basically eliminates any any problems with spam or or poor content. Um, and then also for the recommendation side of it, I use your Twitter following graph. So. The only recommendations you will ever see in Overcast are either from people you follow on Twitter. So if they're spamming, you can unfollow them, and it's you know that's 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 your choice. You know, so it's either from people you have chosen to follow on Twitter, or it's from people. If you don't have enough people who you follow on Twitter, it's from people who are very popular on Twitter, who have tons and tons of followers to the point where it would it would be very very unlikely for any spam to get in that way. Uh, but for the most part, it's based on people you follow only. And so that way, you know, the combination of that plus the iTunes ID filtering means that it's basically impossible for this mechanism to to show spam in, in a meaningful way. And so really, the, the best thing you can do if you have something like this is like design it so that it can't be spammed. And if it can be spammed, outsource the authority over what is spam to somebody big. Exactly. And I think it's probably a good way to close. Like I personally just avoid situations that user generated data would ever be shown to someone else. Like I can't think of an example in any of my app, my products where I do that. Like I look at that problem and I'm like, that is big, scary and yes. not something I want to touch. So <laughs> I just don't. And maybe there, that means that there are some features in my apps that I could have that would be really cool, but I don't, but I just decided that, you know what it's, I'm one person. I'm never going to be able to, or it's going to be really hard to stay on top of it. So I just don't. And that's okay. And I think the important thing for, for like this whole episode's discussion is when you're thinking of that feature, like when, I've when I'm deciding not to add features that show user-generated content to someone else, like the fundamental underlying thing that you have to be, be thoughtful of is when you're building it, you have to be building it with like, what's the worst case scenario in mind? Yep. That it's so easy when you're building something to think of it only from like the cool, obvious, like the way you would use it perspective. But in order for you to have an app that is going to be go with like good for performance for your extreme users or have good security and avoid kind of user, you know, user generated content problems, you have to always be building it sort of with the worst case in mind. And that can be the worst case person, the worst case user, the worst case device, the worst case network, whatever it is. If you build something with the worst case in mind, it's overall going to be better as a result. Exactly. And that's all the time we have this week. Thank you very much for listening, and we will see you next week. Bye.